thing. That's a good thing. There's all kinds of good things happening despite all the bad thing that's going on. And as we started this conversation last week about this idea of embracing adversity, in our culture and in our world today, we got all kinds of adversity. And just this week, we found out something else. We're going to have some more, right? Uh, add to a global pandemic and all kinds of people out of a job and an election and all kinds of tension everywhere. And now we got two hurricanes making their way into the Gulf. It's like, if that wasn't enough, let's just add that to the list, right? 2020 is going to be a year we're going to remember, right? Hopefully for some good things, though. And remember last week, we started off this whole discussion with the definition of what trials actually are. And I want you to remember, too, that that, that word trial or adversity or suffering or discipline, there's all kinds of words used in the Bible, and they kind of mean the same thing. But the definition we're working off of as we talk about this is simply a painful circumstance allowed by God to change my conduct and my character. Because God wants to change both. He wants to change how you act, which is your, which is your conduct, and then he wants to change why you act the way you act, which is your character. He wants to change what you do, and he wants to change who you are. And one of the ways he does that is through bringing and allowing adversity into our lives, allowing pain, allowing suffering, allowing trials to take place to test us. If you got your Bibles, we're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 12. That's where we started last week, and I want to wrap it up um, this week. I'm not wrapping up this series, but this particular point from this text. Let's go to Hebrews 12. I want to read the whole thing, um, and then we'll, we'll parse through it as we go. Starting in verse 5. <clears throat> Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of harvest of righteousness to those who who have been trained by it. By way of review, last week we started unpacking this passage, and the first thing we saw was that adversity in our lives actually validates our relationship with God. If you remember we talked about last week, all throughout this passage, he's talking about how Father disciplines a son. And, and what, what we talked about was the fact that when adversity comes into our life, it validates the fact that we are God's children, that He is our Father. And just as a father disciplines their children, God disciplines us for our good, which we'll get to today. The second thing we saw was that that adversity actually demonstrates that God loves us. Okay? We talked about it last week. Been disciplined by your parents, and how many times did they say, this is for your own good? You may not like it, but I love you, and that's why I'm doing this. Understand this. If God didn't love you, he wouldn't care what you did. He just wouldn't. He'd let you do whatever you wanted. It's kind of like kids. Because you love your kids, you don't let them do whatever they want to do because sometimes what they do is harmful to them or harmful to others. So discipline takes place. The third thing we looked at last week was this. We have to submit to God, whether in times of good, but especially in times of adversity because it's in our submission to God that life happens. It's in our submission to God that we enjoy the life that he intends for us to live. And we'll get into more of that today. And the fourth thing I want you to see from this passage is simply this. What God allows is ultimately good for us. Again, I go, back to, I go back to when you were disciplined by your parents. How many of them ever told you, this is for your own good? Verse 10 in Hebrews 12, he disciplines us for our good. This is also translated as for our profit, like a dividend or like wages. You know, pain can be perfect for some of us because of what comes from it. 
C.S. Lewis said it this way, God whispers to us in our pleasures, he speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It's kind of like going to the dentist. I picked on Casey at the 9 o'clock. I'm going to pick on Casey again. Um, How many of you go to the dentist when your teeth don't hurt? Y'all are too good. I don't, I don't want to. Y'all go get that cleaning and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Casey, a few weeks ago, had a problem with a tooth. And it was like, oh, I can bear it. I can bear it. I can bear it. I, and then one morning it was like, I'm not coming to the office. I'm going to the dentist. Root canal later, he's feeling better. But why? Because he waited till the pain forced him to go get something done. And then the dentist did that wonderful procedure. How many of you love root canals? Yeah, I was going to say, right? Okay, but let me ask you this. How many of you love the feeling after it's over? When the pain is gone, okay? It's for our good. God does the same thing with us, just like a dentist that goes in and he finds a cavity and drills it out. And, oh, man, I tell you what, I just the sound of a drill in my mouth just sends me crawling up a wall, right? Okay, but, but understand, it's got to be done. It's got to be done because if I leave that cavity in there, it's just going to eat its way all the way down. And then I end up having to have root canal or maybe something worse or bad health conditions can, can come from it. So it, it's a necessary evil. It has to be done. Well, God does the same thing with us. He looks inside of us. He sees our sin. He says, that's got to go. And I'm going to do what I can to get rid of it. And at the time, it's painful. But it's for our good that it's gone. It's for our good. You know, some verses come to mind. Genesis 50, 20. You know the story of Joseph. Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers. He ends up falsely accused and thrown in prison. All kinds of bad things happen to Joseph. And by the end of the story, when his brothers come back to Egypt and they're all there together, he makes this statement in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He says this. He says, as for you, and he's talking to his brothers. He says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. In other words, what was an evil act? And don't get me wrong. It was evil that he got sold into slavery. It was evil that that, that he got lied upon and thrown into prison. But God took what happened and used it for good. And God will do the same in your life. And he does. Paul, another person not stra- not a stranger to suffering after he became a christian read read through his laundry list of shipwrecks and beatings and all the different things in romans chapter 5 verse 3 and 4 our scripture reading for this morning paul says this not only that but we rejoice not happy but joyful rejoice is the verb tense of joyful okay we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that what suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope so suffering has a point to it It has a good to it that produces something in our lives. Turn over just a couple of pages in your your chapter of Romans to chapter 8. We get Paul's famous um, passage in Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Not all things are good, but all things work together for God's good in our lives. What I'm saying is don't waste your pain. Because through it and in it, God is weaving his way and his will in your life to accomplish his purposes through that. There's a purpose behind it, and it is for our good. Psalms 119, David says this. I love this passage. He says, before I was afflicted, before God, and and I have no doubt, God is the one who afflicted him. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. And listen, drop down to verse 71. He says, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Why? That I might learn your statutes. In other words, it was through my affliction that I learned you, God. And one of the purposes, one of the goods that comes through our suffering is is, is a deeper understanding and love and appreciation for who God is and what he's trying to do in our lives. I want to share a hard truth with you, but before I do, remember this. Hard truths are the only way out of a hard place. And, you know, in our culture today, we don't like this. 
Because we live in a world that says, I want a quick fix, right? I got this problem in my life, and I want it fixed tomorrow. Ben and I were watching a show last night, My 600-Pound Life. That's what it's called. Okay. And, 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 and I'll tell you what, there's some amazing stories of transformation. That little doctor guy that does all that work, and, and he does some in, incredible stuff with folks who, who are suffering from, from morbid obesity. But, but I'm amazed, though, sometimes at the, at the level of people who, you know, they come in at five, 600 pounds, and they want, they want that weight gone. They want it gone in a month. It's like, you didn't get, you didn't put that weight on in a month. It ain't going to come off in a month, right? It's going to take time. But we want everything fast. We want it to happen quick. I think it's the microwave's fault. You know, years ago, you know, we actually had to cook everything, and then they invented the microwave, and then we, you know, cut that time in half because we've got to have it quicker. Now, don't get me wrong. I like my popcorn, and I love the fact that you can just throw it in there and hit that button, and you got popcorn. Okay. But we want it fixed. We want it fixed quick. But sometimes the suffering, the trials, the hardships that God sends our way aren't quick fixes, but they allow to go on and on and on. So we root out the problem that has to go. And I'm going to say something else that's hard to hear. The trial that you're going through right now could very well be the very best thing that has ever happened to you. And I know what you're saying. There's no way. (laughs) There's no way. Yeah, there is a way. And it's God's way. As it takes me to my next point, and it's simply this. Hard times can be the catalyst for holiness. He goes on to say in verse 10, that we may share His holiness. In other words, after talking about all of this discipline and all of these things that are going to happen, he kind of concludes with, not, not quite concludes it, but he adds in there, the part of the purpose for all this, it's for your good, but it's also that you can share in the holiness of God himself. But see, some of us shy away from holiness because we want happiness. Because we think they're juxtaposed to one another. We think that happiness is over here and holiness is over here. And I have to give up holiness in order to be happy. Or I have to give up happiness in order to be holy. But what we learn through discipline, what we learn through suffering, is that true happiness only comes through holiness. Happiness only comes when I submit myself to the will of God. Happiness only comes when I let God discipline me and correct me in my life and take me to where He wants me to be. That's when true happiness and joy comes in. This complete state of God's centeredness and God's likeness. Because understand, God's end game. His, his, his ultimate purpose in all discipline, in whatever stress or trial you may be going through, His purpose for that is your holiness. And he may use bad things to teach you something that he can't get through to you in any other way. He may have been trying to change things in your life for years, but he just can't get through to you. And now all of a sudden this trial comes along and you said, what good is it? Well, maybe God's finally got your attention and maybe God's finally going to move you into a place of holiness that you couldn't even imagine before. And you see him working this out. Job in Job 23.10, he tells us this. But he knows, this is God, he knows the way that I take. But listen to what he says. But when he has tried me or disciplined me or sent adversity my way, when he has tried me, listen to the outcome, I shall come out as gold. In other words, once God's finished his work with me, as I come out on the other side, what I went through was not pleasant. It wasn't fun. It wasn't happy. But understand, it was God working in me to do things that he couldn't accomplish before. And now once he's worked through me and tried me, I come out the other side refined as gold. Because it's God's purpose to transform us. It's God's purpose to make this this whole process transformational. You see, God will accept us. We sing the song all the time, just as I am. I love that song because what it communicates to us is simply this. As we come to Jesus, we come to Jesus just as we are. 
warts and all, sin and all, baggage and all. I don't care how bad your sin is. I don't care how bad your past is. I don't care about your bad habits, your addictions. I don't care about all of it. God says, I will accept you just as you are. Come. And we come to Christ. And we engage in a relationship with Jesus. But understand this. His purpose through it all is to transform you into the image of his son. He will take you as you are, but he will never leave you as you are. His point is to move you somewhere else. And sometimes, and and I'll just be honest, sometimes for a lot of us, movement is painful. We don't like to move. We get comfortable. We get set. Man, I'll tell you what. I was driving home. Dana and I went and took Bree to school. Dropped her off in Searcy and then went and saw some grandkids. And we're coming back. We drove part of the way back on, what is today? This is Sunday. Part of the way back on Friday, the rest of the way back yesterday. I don't, know, I don't know about you. I'm on, I don't even remember what interstate it was. 65, I think. Uh, no, no, 22. I, it don't matter. How many of you do this? You get, you get on the interstate and you're traveling. You set your cruise control. And you're going. And it's like, perfect. Good. And then up ahead of you, you see the back end of a semi. And then you see another semi in front of him. And you start thinking, uh-oh. Anybody else think, uh uh-oh? Because you know what's going to happen. As soon as you get to the start of a hill, that back semi changes lanes and gets right next to the other semi. And for the next nine miles, that semi in the left lane proceeds to pass the semi in the right lane because his cruise control is set at one one one-hundredth of a mile faster than the one on the right. And you have to... take yours off cruise control and sit there and wait and the whole time you're just going would you just get out of the way how do you think you own the road this is you stay in that lane this is my lane i was going anybody else do that is that just me i see a lot of smiles there's not a lot of honesty right okay why why is that so difficult because we don't want to change man we get comfortable we get locked into cruise control and we're going and we don't want to change and heaven forbid Some guy that's probably delivering the food that I'm going to eat tomorrow change lanes in front of me and I get frustrated about it. Right? Yeah. We don't like change. And God comes along and says, there's something in you I need to change. You see, God sees our suffering and he tells us, though, you may not like it, but also you need to understand it's not going to last forever. What Job tells me is there's another side to this. I may go in and I may be in it, but I am going to come out the other side. Someone made this quote recently. In this country, there's much complaint with little suffering. In some countries, there's much suffering with little complaint. It's amazing that when believers go through trials in other countries and ask for their prayer requests, they don't ask God to rescue them from their trials. They just don't. They ask for boldness. To speak Jesus. They ask for wisdom for their leaders. They ask for uh, deliverance of the people around them. But really there's not much concern about themselves. Because they understand. You see in our country we are privileged. All of us. All of us. Okay. I get get frustrated. (laughs) I I watch what's going on in our world and. And I watch these, these kids running around. I call them kids because I don't see any, a whole lot of gray hairs running around in these, in, these, in these riots and whatnot. And I see people responding and, and they're talking about how bad it is and how, how they want things to be better and, and how oppressed they are and how, how terrible it is and, and how they just can't believe this country is, is in the shape that it's in. And they pull out their $1,300 iPhone and they type in a number and they have DoorDash deliver pizza to the riot. And I'm thinking, really, how bad is it? When you can do that. How oppressed are we, really? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this country's perfect, and I'm not saying we don't have room to grow and things that... But, but understand this. I believe we're way better off than we were 50 years ago. Or 100 years ago, or 200 years ago, or 300 years ago, or 400 years ago. Okay? Can we still improve? Absolutely. But here's the problem. Even in that, here's, here's me. And I, I'm talking to myself this morning. I will watch what's going on and I will see all that stuff and I start complaining. I start complaining about what they're doing. 
on TV, what I see them doing in Portland, what I see them doing here, what I, I can't believe what they're saying over there. I can't believe what they're doing. And I'm complaining. And you know what I need to be doing? I need to be doing like these folks in other countries. I don't need to be pointing my finger at them saying, look what they're doing. God, would you please stop them? What I need to be asking is, God, what are you trying to teach me in this? What are you trying to get me to change in this, God? Instead of looking around to throw blame on everybody else, ask yourself, what in you is God trying to change? Maybe it's patience, maybe it's compassion, maybe it's understanding, who knows? But God is trying to deal with you in what's best for you. I want to learn to pray that God would teach me what he wants me to learn through the trial. Instead of just praying to avoid the trial. Okay. Randy Alcorn said the faith that can't be shaken is the faith that has been shaken. Understand, you don't know how strong your faith is until you've gone through the fire of testing. You might sit back and say, well, I would do this, or I would do that, or I would respond this way. You don't know how you would respond until you've been through that trial yourself. So we also have to be very careful when we're looking at other people and, and offering advice. Well, this is what I would do if I were in your shoes. We have to be very careful to understand, unless you've been in those shoes, you may not be qualified to tell somebody else how to get through that trial. But I will say this, if you are going through a struggle and you are going through a trial, one of the ways I believe that God directs us and leads us is through, is through the church, through the body of Christ, through other Christians. I would say this, if you know of other Christians in your life that have gone through similar trials, I would be knocking on their door, I would be blowing up their phone, asking them, how did you handle it? How did you get through it? Can you help me as well? Because that's one of the ways God speaks to us is through each other. Don't try to do it on your own. But also understand this. The pain that you're in is momentary. And peace will come later. Verse 11 says, For the moment all discipline seems painful, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Some of you right now have more pain in your life than pleasure. Well, hold on, because the peace is coming. It is coming. It was A.W. Tozer who said, Seldom does God use a person greatly who has not been hurt deeply. Friends, if we're faithful and we're patient, there's fruit coming because trials are designed to be transformational. They're designed to get us to change. You know, God promises us a, us a safe landing, but he doesn't always promise us smooth sailing. He doesn't promise that the, that the ride's always going to be free of bumps. The last thing I want to point out from this particular text this morning, and it may be the very most important one, because without it, the others are simply pointless. It's this. My response is my responsibility. Nobody else's. I get this from the last part of verse 11. He says, to those who have been trained by it. Trained by what? Trained by the discipline he's been talking about. This word training can also be translated as exercise. Okay? It's a word that describes the described in that day the athletes who would who would strenuously work on their bodies to, to train them. But trials can also train us for a harvest of righteousness and peace, but it's conditional upon whether or not I am cooperating with what God is doing. If I'm constantly fighting against God's discipline, then it will never work. I must allow myself to be trained by them. And I must look for the purpose that is within the trial, within the pain, to figure out how God is trying to change me. But at the same time, I also have to guard against being bitter because I am having to go through it. So the question for us this morning is simply this. To what extent... Are you willing to be trained by the trials you're going through right now? Two years ago in October, I think, I went hunting with a buddy of mine in Oklahoma. And uh, we were on an island on part of the Arkansas River. And... Uh, 
we were using climbing stands, and if you don't know what that is, come talk to me later. I'm not going to take the time to explain it, okay? But anyway, I was up about, I don't know, 18, 20 feet off the ground in a climbing stand. We'd hunted that morning. I was on my way down. I just started down when the bottom, the bottom half of my climbing stand broke and fell completely to the ground. Well, you can imagine you're going down. All of your weight is on that bottom piece, and when it's gone, you go down. Gravity obviously works, and, and you fall. Luckily, I reached my right arm out, and I caught the upper part of my stand right under this elbow right here, which then caught the full weight of my body as I went down and it jerked and it hung me there okay and I hung there for about 15 minutes until my buddy who I was hunting with finally heard me and he got over and got the bottom of my stand up and as a result I shredded the rotator cuff in my right shoulder and it hurt really bad right at first and in a couple of months I thought I'll get over it a couple of months didn't get over it went to the doctor and the really nice doctor he took his really long needle and he shoved it into my shoulder and he put some wonderful stuff in there. I don't know what it was, but I'm telling you what, it felt great. And my shoulder didn't hurt. And, and I could do anything I wanted for about a year. And then whatever he put in my shoulder finally wore off. About three months ago, that pain said, hello, I'm back. Guess what? That, that thing you tore up, it still tore up. You hadn't fixed anything. Okay. And so I go back to the doctor, and the doctor says, okay, the way I see it, you got three options. Option number one, we'll cut it, we'll cut into it, we'll go in there, we'll do surgery, we'll repair your shoulder. Option number two, I can keep shooting your shoulder up with drugs, and we'll just kill the pain, but that ain't going to fix anything. Option number three, I'm going to send you to a physical therapist, and he's going to see what he can do. So I go to my physical therapy appointment. Really nice guy, I can't pronounce his name, he's from Korea, he's about this tall, um, little big guy. Little big guy can inflict more pain in 15 minutes than anybody I've ever known in my life. All with a smile on his face. That good? Yeah, no, that's not good. Okay. But here's the thing. My shoulder's getting better. I can, I can raise my hand now. Couldn't before. Okay. But my, but my, my physical therapist said, listen, I can, I can fix your shoulder if you will do these exercises. But you know what the problem is? The exercises that he gave me to do, they hurt. They hurt. I don't like to do them. But the end result is simply this. If I don't do it, what happens to my shoulder? It doesn't get fixed. Why? Because my response is my responsibility. How I handle that particular situation is all on me. I can choose to have surgery. I can choose to take drugs. Or I can choose to go through the painful process of fixing it. Now, those three options are really symbolic of a whole lot of things that go on in this world today when it comes to people and their problems. Number one, they want a fix, quick fix. Let's just cut it out and do away with it. Number two, let's self-medicate. Let's just pretend the problem's not there. Or number three, let's do the hard work of actually responding to it and actually fixing it, which is what God wants. When he brings trials and adversity into our life, it is for our good because it's so transformational for us. You know, your particular trial doesn't matter as much as how you respond to it. Often we focus intensely on the details of our difficulties as if our problem was the most important thing in the world. And it may seem like it at the time, but understand your problem is not the most important thing. How you respond to your problem is the most important thing. Understand this, in, in every promise in the Bible that I read, God will take care of what you're going through, but you have to take care of how you go through it. That's on you. Why? Because trials are designed to teach us in order to change both our conduct and our character. So what's your response to bad things that happen in your life? First, don't give up. Don't become passive or bitter or hardened. And understand this, God is no stranger to pain. God is no stranger to suffering. The great news of the Bible is that God is a suffering God. Jesus Christ died a horrible death on a rough cross to provide you with the ultimate solution for suffering and death. John Stott tells this story. I'll just read it to you as best I can. 
He tells a story about how at the end of time, billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light before them, but some groups near the front talked heatedly, not with cringing shame, but with angry words. Can God judge us? How can he know about suffering? Snapped one Jewish woman as she ripped up and opened a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. A pregnant teenager cried out, a minority wondering why there's so much racism in the world, someone from Hiroshima, others who were born deformed, others who were murdered. They all expressed their complaints against God for the evil and the suffering that he had permitted in their lives. What did God know of weeping and hunger and hatred? God lives a a privileged life in heaven, they said. In the center of the plain, they consulted with each other, and they elected leaders to argue on their behalf. At last, they were ready to present their case, and it was a rather clever case. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, they decided he must endure what they endured. Their decision that was, was that God would be sentenced to life on earth. Then they pronounced his sentence. Let him be born a Jew. And let the legitimacy of his birth be in doubt. Give him work to do that is so difficult that even his family will think he's crazy for doing it. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges. Let him be tried by a prejudiced jury. Let him be convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. Let him see what it's like to be alone, really alone. Then let him die. Let him die so there can be no doubt that he died. And make sure there's plenty of witnesses to verify that he died. And as East leader leader announced his portion of the sentence, a hush fell over the entire crowd, and no one uttered a word. And no one moved. And a weight fell on each face. For suddenly they all knew that God had already served that sentence in Jesus. Sometimes we forget that the Lord that we serve has suffered as much, if not more, than we ever will. Ever. I want to go back and catch the first part of Hebrews 12. And the lesson is yours because it ties together the purpose, I think, and the power behind what God does in his discipline in us and through adversity. Let's go back. Read chapters, back to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's read 1 through 11 together. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which so closely which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Listen, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Listen, for for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Consider him, consider Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So that you can be encouraged by what Jesus went through. In your struggle against sin, since you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood. Don't forget, have you not forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Your sons, just like Jesus. My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
Church, pain, trials, suffering, it's a part of the Christian life, but it has a point. It has a transformational point. It has a godly point and a purpose in your life. So embrace adversity. And through this we've seen, I hope, you, I hope you've got these as we go through them. Embrace adversity because it validates your relationship with God. It demonstrates God's love for us. We have to submit to Him in the midst of it if we want life and if we want to live. Fourthly, what God allows is for our good. And see those hard times as they come as a catalyst for holiness, which leads to joy and happiness. And don't forget that pain is momentary. Peace will come later. And above all, do not forget, my response is my responsibility. How you respond to the pain in your life is no one's responsibility but your own. See it for what it is. See it for what God is trying to do. And then embrace it. Embrace it as God transforms you into what he wants you to be. I don't know what you're going through personally in your life, but I do know what it is has passed through the very hands of God before it got to you. And it has the potential to transform you into a deeper level of understanding of God's love than ever before. But you must be willing to be trained by it, disciplined by it for your good, but ultimately for his glory. This morning, as I said earlier, if you need the prayers of your family here because of the trials you're going through, you don't have to go through them alone. Come and ask. Let us bear your burden with you. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus, you're trying to carry a burden by yourself that you just don't have the strength to lift. You are not strong enough to deal with your own pain. Allow him to use your trials to transform you into his image. But just like how you respond to trials is your responsibility, how you respond to Jesus is your responsibility as well. No one can respond to Jesus for you. You must make that decision yourself. This morning, whatever you need, let us know as we stand and as we sing.